Hey, good morning, everybody. For those of you who are with us in person, we welcome you. For those of you online or downstairs in the family room, we welcome you as well. It is really good to be together. I, I totally understand that this does not feel normal. I, I get that we do have some of that nostalgia from what things used to be like. And my friends, we're going to get there again, okay? This is not how it's going to be forever. So thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for participating in some of the, the mitigations that we put in place uh, here live. And for those of you who continue to join us online, we, we thank you for that as well. Hey, I want to begin our time together by reading a small portion out of Matthew chapter 7. At the very end of Jesus' uh, you know, some of his greatest teaching, what we know is the Sermon on the Mount, he says this, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then when the chaos of life came up, when an election season happened, or a global pandemic hit the world, they did not fall because they had their foundation built on this rock. And so we're going to sing some songs about uh, the hope that we have in Christ, the cornerstone, the rock that is Christ. And I pray that this just may be a declaration from us of where our trust and our hope is going, our cornerstone, our sure foundation, Jesus Christ, his teachings, his life, and his life in us. Would you please stand as we begin our time of worship together? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. But holy trust in Jesus' Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. between us, how high 
Father, it is so easy to get caught up in the stresses and the worries and the chaos. Everything in our society and in our nation and in our world that causes us fear. All the things that we can't control. And I pray, Father, that we would resist the urge to place any part of our foundation upon any political structure or man-made system, Father. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. 
empires rise, empires fall, but your kingdom, Father, your way, Father, the way of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, not only the life you live, but the life that is embedded in us persists and continues. It is transgenerational and transcultural, Father. It is overlapping every ideal way of life. And so I pray, Father, that we might be a people who place our trust in you and our foundation is built upon you and our hope is in you. In these very trying and challenging days, Father, may we rest more and more of that, surrender more and more of it to you. For you, you alone are the living hope, Father, uh, because you came into this world to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Seeing us in such a desperate need, Father, you came and you saved us. And so, Father, we are a grateful people, a very blessed people, Father, and a very grateful people. May you receive all the praise for all the good that we do as a church and as individuals. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. You may take a seat. Hello, friends. Welcome to Restoration Church. Whether you're joining us online or in person today or down in the family room. Right, because even in person we have two locations. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so glad that you're here. Uh, our first Sunday back in the building. Official, yes. Officially. Mm -hmm. So exciting. Yep. Uh, a, few, a few things we uh, do want to draw your attention to. If you're a guest with us, whether online or in person, mm -hmm. we have a gift for you for being here uh, today. Uh, it's a teal mug. We'd love to get that into your hands. And just by telling us a little bit about who you are, we donate $3 to the Interfaith Food Alliance here in Morrisville. So you're helping to uh, help food insecurity here in our region by telling us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, so you'll be able to fill out that card to get that mug either by the online connection thing that's going to be dropped link that I can't even think of the word or um, if you're in person um, in the family room we're going to try to deliver that right to you and if you are upstairs with us in our main room you can go outside there's a tent outside I believe mm -hmm. that you can go and fill out that card and Get your mug. Get your gift, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. All right, what else do we have going on, Ross? Yeah, so we are about to enter into a season uh, we call Be Rich. We do this annually, and there's just so much going on. And this is actually <laughs> the scaled back version of Be Rich because of COVID and of other factors. We have decided to scale back. Because of social distancing. Little, and yeah, it's like, just yeah. a lot of things are challenging that we love to do for our community. But there's a, still a lot of things we're going to do. A lot of things that you can participate in helping us be a generous church within our community, helping us um, make God's love and and our relationship with him known to those who might be far from him. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we really do hope for 100% participation in one form or another. And a lot of ways you can participate. You could give, we're asking $40, um, $40 to the cause. You can go into our website. You can text um, 40 to 8, 40 be rich to 84321. Um, you can give through the app. You can, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can participate. Uh, you could also donate some items, and so we'll go to, we'll talk through what we're doing here in Be Rich in just a second. But um, you could donate. And you, I, you know give. what, Ross? I see people are bringing stuff in already. So we already saw this morning a bunch right. of diapers come in, yeah. and the cart. We have a shopping cart filled with food. That's it's right. Getting filled with food. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so sorry, you're gonna but, run through the but, list. But of keep, what people can but get. keep giving. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then you can serve. And so those are the three ways that we hope that you can participate okay, so one wait, way or wait. another. We want everybody to participate like in one way or another. Give, donate, and serve. And serve. Yep. So we have a okay. we have a food drive, as Emily had mentioned. Um, we're we're trying to raise Thanksgiving products, uh, which you can see here, um, for the. Uh, Interfaith Food Alliance to help those with food insecurity have a great Thanksgiving. We're going to be cleaning up a portion, a two-mile stretch of, of roadside and Fairless Hills that we've chosen to adopt. Um, we are going to be paying for all the laundry um, for every piece of clothing that comes into the laundry zone um, in Over, Morrisville. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we just have a day here within our own community, the restoration community, but also some some local houses here right around our, our neighborhood um, to serve them and to help take care of them. We are trying to raise, uh, not raise, uh, gather 20,000 diapers and 25,000 wipes mm -hmm. to bless those um, who that is a struggle for within our area. We're also um, going to have the Giving Tree, which is our, our Christmas um, 
Oh, Christmas. It's a lot of words you're saying here. It's a lot of words it? I'm saying. So we like to adopt families like in you. need over the holidays. Yes. And, um, <laughs> like and and then we bring small groups of our people around them. It doesn't have to be just one family adopting a family. We get our people, yeah. a combination of families to come around and provide a really nice Christmas for our families that are in need. That's right. So, yes. yeah. and, then the, and then we are putting together homeless bags for our shared meal community and those in need within our community. Now, that is a lot of information. Where can people go Ooh. to read all of that and find out really like the deeper details? Yeah, the Be Rich tab of our website yes. is the easiest place to go. So go to our website. You can sign up for things there to serve again. You can give right there if you want to give. Um, and maybe you can't give $40, but you could donate a can of soup or you could donate a pack of diapers. Or maybe you are at a position in life where you can do it all. You want to give beyond, yeah, $40. Right? You want to give more than $40 maybe. You want to contribute diapers and food and you want to serve. So really it's a it's available. We want to stretch you in your generosity. So ask yourself what would be a sacrificial act for me to do? Maybe I can't afford forty dollars, but maybe I can do a box of diapers yeah, or something, you know. Yeah. But maybe I can do it all. So, Whew. you're making me giggle. You don't want to know why? Because you're using oh. all your words for the whole day, like in this three hours. <laughs> I know. Yeah, <laughs> so I'll I be quiet. The rest you to be of the very day. quiet yes, after church yeah. today. Yeah. Oh, so. funny. Um, so we're, like, yeah. we're we're a generous church. We yeah. try to be a generous church, and because and why? Because God is generous towards us and has right. been generous towards us. And Very he has entrusted to us all that we have to, to manage it well. So mm -hmm. um, one of the ways to do that is through our weekly tithing. Right. Um, and so everything that we mentioned is above and beyond. It's an offering, mm -hmm. which is above and beyond the, the tithes that God has called us to give. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are four easy ways to give to the cause of Christ here. Uh, you can give online. You can give through the app. You can text 84321. Or you can give cash or check in an envelope. Good job, We're in the mail. So, uh, would you like to say prayer first? Yes, since I'm I'll out of words, now? words. Okay, thanks. Yes, <laughs> Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we are able to gather back in our building um, in a safe way that hopefully keeps our community healthy. We do pray for that provision mm -hmm. of health and protection as we gather in this space. Um, we thank you for our friends online, for our friends in the family room. I just pray that as we take a moment to pause and thank you for the great gifts that you've given us, that you would help us to really evaluate our lives and, and even acknowledge just how rich we are. Yeah. Um, we are, it, most of us are in like the top 3% of wealth in the entire world. And so I just pray that you would help us to be faithful stewards of what you've entrusted to us um, so that yeah. ultimately more people can come to know of you through your generous love through our people here at Restoration right. and beyond. We just um, entrust these gifts to you. We thank you for everyone who faithfully gives to your mission here. And we look forward to seeing how the fruit that will come from our faithfulness in giving this season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, is, is that an Ella Funky? Hey there, guys. Any room in the middle? No. No. Okie dokie. musical background choice I think is appropriate for this season, right, that we are all enduring. Hey, we are starting a brand new series titled Capital Concern this morning. You may have guessed from uh, the branding of this that it has a political bent to it, and it makes sense. We are in a very heated political season right now, but this is really about where our politics intersects with our faith. Our politics intersects with our religion. Our politics inter inter intersects with our Christianity because of current events, this series, I think, is probably going to make some of us uncomfortable, but I also believe that this series is going to make us better. And that's really my hope, that at the end of this, we are better people for having gone through this. We have never been a church that has shied away from hard topics. We've never ever been a church that has been afraid to, to discuss where the world is at and what the world is dealing with, because we believe that we have the hope of the world. We have the solution, ultimately, that the world is looking for and longing for, and so we are not a church that is going to shy away from hard conversations. And so here we are, capital concern. If you are a Christian, here is our tension, okay? R right now in our society, in our day and age, here's our tension. And if you're not a Christian, you get to sit back and you get to judge us about how well we do this. And, and I think what the world is going to look at, and we've talked about this over the weeks, the world is going to look at the church and they're going to realize that the church is not doing this well. The church is not doing it well. Christians aren't doing it well, right? The Christians are just as polarized as the rest of the world. Christians are just as easy to throw those slanders and those slurs and that condemnation and that judgment into the pit just like the world is. 
the world is going to look at us and it's going to determine maybe the, maybe the church isn't doing this very well. And I think that maybe if the, if the world saw us in, in this context doing this well, maybe, maybe the world wouldn't have abandoned the faith when they did. Maybe the world wouldn't have walked away from faith when they turned 18. Maybe the world wouldn't look at us and say, you know what, I want absolutely nothing to do with that. And so here's our tension, right? Here, here, here's what I, I, I hope for us today. Are we willing, as followers of Jesus, are we willing to put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to be Christ followers first and Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians second? Are we willing to follow Jesus when following Jesus separates us from our political party, our political candidate, our political bent? When following Jesus creates space between us and our political pa- platform, are we willing to do that? Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we don't talk about politics. I'm not suggesting that, that we not be political. I'm not suggesting that we don't wade into politics or, or, or talk about politics or, or run for office, even if you're called to run for office. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that we take what Jesus said seriously. We have to, right? As followers of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to. You have to take what Jesus said seriously. And not allow the political climate that we are currently in to divide us, to divide the church, the big C church, as well as the little C church, the local church. Now we're going to talk about this more in in two weeks as we conclude this series. But what Jesus wanted most for his followers, what Jesus prayed for in his very last hour, what he longed for deep within him was that we would be one. That nothing would come and divide us. But that we would have unity. That would figure out a way that we would figure out a way to disagree politically, but that we would still love unconditionally as we together pray for unity. The church has historically been bad at this, not only politically, but in all ways. A a few years ago, I preached a message on um, Genesis 1, and we all know Genesis 1, of course, that's controversial, right? So uh, I preached a message on Genesis 1. And there's a lot of different interpretations on this, but uh, a woman approached Emily after, after I preached this message, and she said, your husband is on a slippery slope to hell. I kid you not, that's her, those were her exact words. Because my interpretation and what I presented to congregation, I didn't present this as dogma, I just said here's one viewpoint of this, of this very challenging passage. But, but this is what Christians do to each other. You don't agree with me? Well, you know what? You're going to hell. You don't agree with me, then I'm going to separate. You know what we do? 35,000 denominations have been created historically within Christianity because, you know what, I don't agree with you, so I'm going to go up the road and I'm going to start my own church. And you know what, we're going to be segregated and we're not going to talk to each other and we're not going to be on mission together and we're not going to collaborate because you think differently about infant baptism than I do. And you think differently about Genesis 1 than I do. And you think differently about Revelation than I do. And the church is like, man, we're, we're alone on this little island. Restoration Church is all alone in Levittown trying to do this work together. When I first moved here, planting a church, I reached out to 11 different churches. And only one reached back. We like our little islands, man. You don't have to agree with me. I don't care. Well, you can agree whatever you want to, but we're not going to collaborate. We're not going to come together. <sighs> we disagree. Politically, theologically, yes. But can we continue to love unconditionally? Can we continue to pray for unity? And so, capital concern, right? We, we labeled this series Capital Concern, and our capital concern, our primary concern, is not who the next president's going to be. Our primary concern is not which party is going to win. Our capital concern, our primary concern, is can we maintain a love for one another even if we disagree? Can we maintain unity even if we don't see things the same way? That is our capital concern and what we'll be talking about over the next three weeks. Now, the interesting thing is, in the first century, everyone wanted to be Jesus, uh, G- everyone wanted Jesus to be in their side, in, the, in their corner, on their side, and it's the same with us today, isn't it? They would question him and try to pigeonhole him and push him into their corner, and everyone wanted Jesus to be on their side. And everyone is convinced today that if Jesus were to come back, that, okay, you know, if Jesus were to come back, then, then certainly he would be a Republican because of his care and his concern for the Republican values, right? No, 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 of course Jesus would be a Democrat because of his concern and his care for people. And if someone were to ask me to write a sermon that would illustrate that the Republican Party and the platform is in sync with Jesus, you know, I could do that. 
And if someone else were to come and say, you know, Ross, could, could, you, could you write a sermon about how, how the, the Jesus is in sync and in line with the Democratic Party? Well, yeah, I, I could do that too. Because when we interpret the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus through the filter of our political filter, then we can make Jesus say whatever we want Jesus to say. It's amazing how often Jesus agrees with you when you put his words through your political filter. Both sides quote Jesus, both sides quote the Bible, and the funny thing is that they use the same verses. They use the same passages, they use the same scripture to do so. And so the question is, can we put our Jesus-following filter, our faith filter, ahead of our political filter? And it's really difficult to do. It's really challenging to do. But I'm going to try to show you the way forward. It's not going to be easy because the way of Jesus is always going to conflict with systems and structures of power. So it's not going to be easy, but I really, really want to show you the way forward. Here's what we know. Jesus came to introduce the kingdom of God to earth. The kingdom of God values the upside-down kingdom when those with wealth and power and resource leverage their power and their wealth and the resources for those who have none. When the king lays down his life for the betterment of his people rather than demanding that his people lay down their life for him. The kingdom of God that is so broad and inclusive and everybody is invited to participate in it. But the kingdom of God in some ways will always conflict with the kingdom of man. I believe this. The kingdom of God is always in some ways and on some level always going to conflict with the kingdom of man. And the kingdom of God will in some ways always conflict with your political party and your political candidate. And there is always then going to be tension. Because who are you going to put out in front? What are you going to follow? Are you going to put your life through the Jesus filter or through the political filter? I mean, this is why it's so foolish for the church to ever be divided over a political candidate or a political party, because at the end of the day, no political party is going to completely line up with the kingdom of God values and the values of Jesus, even though each party has a little bit of it. Even if that's difficult for some people to acknowledge. But again, it's foolish to be divided because we are supposed to be kingdom of God people first and political people second. It's really, really difficult to do. So I'm going to give you a simple template to help you understand where agreement ends and personal opinion begins. If you're a follower of Jesus, please pay attention because this is so very, very important. So Paul, Paul was a follower of Jesus in the first century. He, he initially hated the church. He wanted to do everything in his power to, to eliminate the church, but he eventually had an experience with Jesus, and he came to, to surrender his life to Christ, and he became the greatest missionary the church has ever known. He wrote half of what we now have as our New Testament. He puts together this template for us as he refers twice in his letters, once in 1 Corinthians and once in Galatians, to this thing called the Law of Christ. Now, the Law of Christ was really his shorthand of Jesus' new covenant command. When Jesus gathers for his, with his disciples on that very last night, that same night that he prayed for unity with his people, which we'll talk about in two more weeks, he says that I'm giving you a brand new command. Like, okay, Jew Jewish people, they had 613 commands, and Jesus says, I'm giving you a brand new command. I'm taking all that you learned in the Torah, all 613 commands that you had in the Old Testament, and I'm bundling them all up into one simple command, and it is this. This is my law. This is my command. I want you to love one another the same way that I have loved you. Love one another. This is the law of Christ. Love one another in the same way that I have loved you. This isn't just a love fest, right? You are to love one another. This isn't a one-way love. This is a two-way love. This is reciprocating love. This is I give, I receive. I give, I receive. I love, and I am loved. Two-way love as I have loved you. And by this, by this unique brand of love that I am initiating and demonstrating in the world, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, it's a two-way thing. This is about community. This is a family thing. Everyone in there loving one another, but not just in any way that we want to love, in the way that Jesus demonstrated what love is like. Self-sacrifice for who? The other. And who is the other? Oftentimes, enemies. Enemies. If we would love one another the same way that God, through Jesus, has loved us, this is the law of Christ. And so Paul takes this idea and he pushes it through all of his letters. 
in the New Testament as the one uniting ethic for all Jesus followers. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. This phrase, right, the law of Christ, is the phrase that he uses to take his readers back to that night and that big idea when Jesus finally laid down this kingdom ethic. This is the marching orders for all people who decide to follow Jesus. Two quick examples of how Paul does this. In Corinth, he says, Though I'm free and I belong to no one, I have made myself a slave. Right? This is strong language, especially in their day and age when, when slaves were everywhere. I've made myself a slave to everyone. And why have I done this? To win as many as possible. You see, I'm on mission, and I don't have much time left, and I've wasted a lot of my time because I was trying to destroy the church rather than push the agenda of the church forward. And so I'm going to do everything, you know, short of sinning to win people to Christ. I'm willing to go to any extreme and any length in hopes that some might be saved, in hopes that some who are far from God might know that God has come into the world to do something for the world and to do something for the world and on behalf of the world. I came into the world, I, I, I have made myself a slave to, do, to win as many as possible. And to those not having the law, right, that's the, the law of Moses, to those who are Gentile, I became like one not having the law. So I became a Gentile in order to reach Gentiles, he says. That's the extreme that he's willing to go. Though I am not free from the law of God, to which a Jewish reader would say, what, what do you mean? You, just, you, you, you talked about how you're, you're not under the law anymore, but what are you talking about? It's so, so confusing, probably, to to the, the Jewish reader. But he would say, yeah, I'm still under God's authority. I'm just not under the Mosaic law. I'm not under the Torah. I'm still under God's authority. And then he says what law he, then he is under. He says, no, I am under the law of Christ. I'm no longer under the law of Moses, but I'm still under God's authority because I'm under the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is, you shall love one another the same way that God has loved us or that Christ has loved us. In Galatians, he says, carry each other burden, carry each other's burdens. When you see someone's burdens financially or, or parenting burdens or with their kids, physical ailments, you are to carry each other. This is a, a one another, right? This is reciprocity. This is back and forth. If you see that I am burdened, then I would hope that this body of believers, this Christ followers under the law of Christ would come around me and my family and help carry me. When we see that you are a burden, then, then we rally around families who are burdened. And when we do this, Paul says, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. And law of Christ being that we are to love one another in the same way Christ has loved us. So when the concerns of others concern you, then you act on it. You are fulfilling the law of Christ. You are doing what Jesus told his disciples to do. And these are the New Testament marching orders for anybody who claims to follow Jesus. So as Jesus followers, regardless of your political persuasion... The law of Christ is your marching orders. This is our law. And this law, then, should inform, over time, our conscience. So as the template continues, right, we have this law of Christ. This is, this is fundamental to everything that we do as followers of Jesus. And this law should then inform our conscience. So your conscience should become hardwired into the law of Christ. So when we do something that is contrary to the law of Christ, it should ding our conscience. You guys ever experienced that before? We, we, we know it in ourselves, right? We, we, we feel it all the time. When we do something that is contrary to the law of Christ, it should ding our conscience. And not only individually, it should ding our collective conscience. We, we, we as a, a group of people should, should mourn together the brokenness of our world. We should all be together disturbed and irritated and convicted by all of the same things or by some of the same things. We should be disturbed and irritated and convicted when we see injustice and when we accidentally disrespect someone or, or we don't give someone what they deserve. When, when we see someone undermining their own future, their health, or their relationships with their kids, the integrity of their family, or the integrity of their society, we should be moved by that. And we should then be moved to action. It should bother us. We should be disturbed and irritated and convicted when we see the brokenness in the world and in our communities. Whenever we see someone expressing autonomy that undermines their family or their health or their community, it should bother us. Whenever we see someone with the bounds of, within the bounds of Christianity violating the law of Christ, it should disturb us, it should irritate us, it should convict us. It should ding our conscience, it should bother our conscience. And when we see it happening outside the church, we should, we should discuss what an appropriate measured response looks like. But our collective conscience, the thing that moves us to apology, that thing that moves us to action, 
It's all tied to the idea that we should love other people the same way that God, through Jesus, has loved us. That we should respect other people because Jesus respects us. That we should recognize the dignity of other people because Jesus recognized the dignity in us. The law of Christ should inform our conscience. And so I want you to take your cue for how you treat other people, whether they're within your own political party or not, according to Jesus and the law of Christ that he gave us. And so if we want to set policy for what's good for people, my friends, this is what is good for people. The law of Christ should inform our collective conscience. Now, as simple as that is, this is a really powerful dynamic if you think about it. In fact, this dynamic shaped all of Western culture. The reason that we are here standing here today in the world in which we live in is because this very simple law informed people's conscience, which changed Western culture. Just a couple of examples to show you how this works. Once, a ton, once upon a time, everywhere in the world, every village, every town, every kingdom— it was self-evident, meaning that it was just obvious, right? It was just, it's just natural. It's just how the world works. Nobody debated this. Nobody questioned this. Nobody second thought this. It was just natural. It was unquestioned that some people should be owned and controlled by other people. The whole idea of slavery, people owning pe- people, it was self-evident. It, it wasn't a moral issue. It was not even a question. It was just the way of things. In the 4th century B.C., Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, whose responsibility, a Greek philosopher's responsibility, was simply to look at the universe and look at the world and say, here's all the pieces of the puzzle and here's how they all fit together. And so they wanted to make one coherent landscape that, that you could put your life through and understand the world through, the way people act and behave and science, a, a really just a holistic understanding of how the world works. Here's what he said. For that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary... It's expedient. It's just natural. It it, it creates the most well-functioning society. He's talking about slavery, right? Not only is slavery necessary, it's, it's expedient. There's no way that the world would work if other people didn't control and own other people. It's just the way that it is. It's self-evident. It's obvious. It's just natural. It's just the way that the world works. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection and others for rule. And so the idea of doing away with slavery, that's not even a question. That's like saying the sun's not even going to come up. They didn't even question. But in the 4th century AD, after Christ introduced this law and it began to inform consciences, Augustine, a 4th century bishop, said, no, slavery is, is not natural. It's a result of sin. And suddenly a brand new idea was born from his brilliant mind. And even though slavery was a very stable part of his society, people began to question it and debate it and challenge it. Slavery isn't expedient. It's not a part of nature. Slavery is a part of sin. Once upon a time, another example, it was self-evident, it was obvious that infanticide, or in the Roman world they would call it exposure, it was just good for a society. There were certain laws in certain parts of the Rome, <clears throat> Roman world where you were actually required to allow your baby to die because there just weren't enough resources to go around. In some cases, it was because maybe you had a girl and you didn't want another girl. In some cases, it was when the, when the infant came out and you looked at that child, the, the child was deformed, or maybe you just didn't have enough food to go around with the children and the, and the people already in your household, and so you decided to expose that child. And to expose your child simply meant that you, you left the baby outside the walls of the village, or you took that baby down to the edge of the woods, and you just left it there. You, you walked to the riverbank, and you just left the baby on the riverbank. Now, you weren't legally culpable for the death of your child because you weren't the one who killed it, right? The fates killed your child. You just left the child down by the riverbank, and yeah, the child rolled into the river and drowned. Yeah, but you didn't kill the child. The fates killed the child. Yeah, you left the child out by the edge of the forest, but the wolves killed the child, not you. So you weren't actually legally culpable for the death of your child. And so if the child, you know, you came home from war and, and your wife was found to be pregnant because she had slept with another man, then, then you had every right within their society to take that child when it was born and go expose it. If you didn't want that child because it was a girl or there were deformities or whatever it may be, for really any reason you wanted, you could go and abandon that child to the fates. Now, you couldn't kill the baby yourself, 
But it was self-evident to just let the child die. But there were Christians. Christians came along. From the very beginning, they disagreed, and they condemned exposure, and they condemned infanticide. And eventually, Christians would go to the edge of those forests, and they would go down by the riverbanks, and they would gather up those children, and they would bring them back to their own small little homes, and they would share their own little resources with those children because they believed that these children had value. Totally, totally radical thinking within the first century. And why? I mean, nothing required of it. There wasn't any scripture that demanded them to do this. It was because love required it. As they began to understand what it meant to be made in the image of God and the law of Christ which was informing their conscience and that we have been loved and that God acted at like us. We were little babies who had been abandoned and God comes near to us and he adopts us as his own. And so they said, of course, we the Christians who have been informed by the law of Christ and our conscience is dinging as we see these children being abandoned, of course we're going to go and we're going to bring them home. And as Christianity began making inroads into the Roman world, the communal conscience began to be affected by Christianity. In 318, Emperor Constantine declares for the very first time in the Roman world that infanticide is a crime, that exposure is a crime. I mean, why this change? Because it became a conscience issue. And why? Because the teaching of Jesus began to infiltrate the Roman world. And in 374, Emperor Valentinian made exposure a capital offense. So you could actually lose your life if your child lost its life because of your neglect. So when the law of Christ informs an individual or a village or a city or a nation's conscience, things begin to change. And there has been so much change, even in our nation, because of these same dynamics. It's so simple, isn't it? But it's so brilliant, and it's amazing how the world has been affected by it. Jesus' single new covenant command was so powerful, and it was so ahead of its time, and it was so modeled and baked into the crucifixion and the resurrection and it is transcultural, and it is transgenerational, and it sits at the very epicenter of all of God's kingdom values. It will never go out of date. It doesn't have a shelf life. We are forever and ever to do this for others because this is what Christ has done for us. This is the ethic, and this is the morality that is to inform our conscience and as we have influence in the world to inform the conscience of our community, we have the great privilege of being the church to illustrate and to live under the law of Christ and not only to inform our conscience, but to help our community and our society have an informed conscience as well, shaped by the law of Christ. See, part of our responsibility is to be salt and light, is it not? We are to be the conscience of the nation. We are to be the conscience that shapes the ways and the morality of the nation. And so, my friends, if we, who have this great responsibility, are divided, how is that going to help shape the nation? How is that going to help inform the nation? We cannot be divided, especially over political issues and especially over candidates and platforms and parties that come and go and come and go. It is incumbent upon us to be one, as Jesus called us to be one, in spite of our political differences. Which leads us to then our third part of our template. So we have the law of Christ, which informs our conscience. And then to an informed conscience, we are to incorporate knowledge and wisdom. Now one of the great advantages of the human race is that we are able to collect information and pass it on to the next generation. Now no other animal or being on the planet is able to do this. Dogs can't write letters to their next of kin and say, this is how you should be a dog in your life. Here's what I've learned about being a dog, and this then is how you should be a dog. We can't do that. Dogs can't do that. But we, because of writing and because of storytelling and because of nowadays recordings, right, we can pass on information and wisdom on to the next generation. And so as people of the 21st century, we need to think about what it looks like to live out this kingdom ethic that is added then to an informed conscience. And then we need to add onto that informed conscience, right? The knowledge of science and psychology and understanding of how our world works and how we're made. And all of this then begins to work together. If someone were to ask you, for instance, where do babies come from? Wouldn't your answer to them and your response be to accommodate to 
their ability and their capacity. If a four-year-old comes to you and say, hey, where do babies come from? Of course you're going to give them a measured response. Of course you're going to try to accommodate to their knowledge and their understanding and the wisdom that they have. You're not going to lie to them, but you're going to tell them a, a, a version of the story of where babies come from. Now, if a 15-year-old comes to you and says, hey, where do babies come from? Of course you'd say, you should know by now. And so, I don't know why you're asking me this. But, but really, that's, that's, we, we accommodate to people's knowledge all of the time. And our Heavenly Father does this. He accommodates to the capacity of his people all of the time. See, in Genesis, we see God accommodating to a capacity of ancient pre-science, pre-tile, and all these people who have never taken a warm shower a day in their life. And he is, he is accommodating to their capacity to understand how the world works. But when Jesus arrives, Jesus said that he comes to reveal God and he explains God in ways that the Old Testament never could explain God because God's people and his capacity have changed over time. They have an info information and they have greater knowledge. They have greater wisdom that has been passed down from generation to generation. And in every generation, our knowledge and our insight increases and God's ability to help us understand how he made us and how the world works then increases as well. And so as Christians, we should be on the forefront we should be the most curious, uh, the most interested. We should never resist science or discovery. We should be the most curious because our faith is not tethered to any of that. Our faith is tethered, tethered to an event that happened in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we should incorporate into our informed conscience the knowledge and the wisdom that comes with this age that has been handed down to us from generation to generation. And so the knowledge and wisdom combined with an informed conscience is what we then should use to leverage and to determine what policies and platforms and legislations we support. And so one more time, the law of Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus, my friends, this is a non-negotiable. This is where it all begins. These are our marching orders. This is, this is our command. This is what our life should be about, the law of Christ, that our life should be lived in love for others because that is how God lived towards us. And that law then should inform our conscience over time. And as we learn more and more and more to follow Jesus, the longer you follow Jesus, the more your conscience is going to be shaped by that law of Christ. And then to that, we add knowledge and wisdom. I mean, this is really just a bit intuitive, right? This is why when your kid gets sick, you don't call me, you call the doctor. Once upon a time, they would say that if your kid was sick, you would call the priest. Now, I'm not, I'm not dismissing that healing power. I'm not dismissing that faith heals but we have an informed, uh, we have greater knowledge, we have greater wisdom. This is why you call the doctor, and certainly I'll pray over your child, but you don't even call me for that usually. You call the doctor, because we understand how the body works, and we understand how the world works. And to that, then, knowledge, that greater knowledge, that greater wisdom, we add how we understand policies, platforms, and legislations. We naturally and intuitively incorporate knowledge and wisdom into our thinking, and so why not apply it to our policies, our platform, and our legislation? But here's the rub. When it comes to this, when it comes to the policies and the platforms and the legislations that we choose to support, there will always be disagreement among Christians. There, there can't be disagreement among the law of Christ. How it inform our conscience, that's, that's up to us, right? And, and that's going to change, and it's going to grow, and, and we're going to we're going to be paced with that. Everyone's going to go at their own pace. But policies and platforms and legislations, there's always going to be disagreement. And the reason we will always disagree, and this is where we have work to do, and this is where it's going to be challenging for us, and this is where the tension grows. But this is where I also hope that we'll have an open mind as we interact with one another. The reason we'll always have work to do, the reason that we're always going to, going to disagree on this is that where we stand depends on where you sit. Where you are willing to take a stand depends on where you sit. It depends on your perspective. This is actually called the Miles Law, named after Rufus Miles, who was part of the Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson administrations. It means that our cultural context, where we sit, where we live, who you're related to, how much money you make, where you sit, determines your perspective in life. What you see, what you experience, how you interpret it. This is true of all of us, and this is why most of you don't see any conflict between your faith and your politics. I mean, so, some of you are, are, are loving the idea of this series because you have friends who desperately need to hear it. You have friends who desperately need 
to hear it. But you're good. And you're golden on all this. And you got it. If this was an amen church, you'd be amening at all this. Where you stand depends on where you sit. People need to put their faith first. You would say, yes, absolutely. And that is why I'm a Republican. Because when people put their faith first, clearly the Republican Party is right. And yes, people need to put their faith first. And that is why I'm a Democrat. And clearly when you put your faith first, the Democrats are right. But you know that your political views weren't shaped in a vacuum, right? I mean, you get that, right? We all get that. Our perspective on life, they're not shaped in a vacuum. And pausing to recognize this and pausing long enough then to incorporate this into your thinking is what it means to be mature. And oh my goodness, do we not need just a little bit more maturity in this election cycle? See, pausing to recognize this is, my friends, the way forward. It's how the extremes, if they are mature, are willing to move towards the middle. And I'm not suggesting that we all just meet in the middle and have one big old kumbaya party, all right? But let me say it again. There's always going to be disagreement when it comes to policy, platform, and legislation. And that's okay. As long as we are mature enough to, let, to not let it divide us, especially the Christians. And if we're mature enough to not let it divide us, then we will be better for the conversation. We'll be better people for the conversation. It's a step towards political unity and unity in spite of political diversity. See, your political views and your values, like all of your views and your values, they are shaped by a variety of things, most of which we have no control over. And, and if we can acknowledge this and take a deep breath and learn something, and learn something. And we don't change what we believe. We don't have to change what we believe, but we gain understanding in terms of why other people act and why other people believe the way that they do. Then we won't experience division. And so here are just a few of the things that impact the way that you think politically. Where you live, where you were raised, how you were educated, if you were educated, what you've been told, what you've seen, what you've experienced, and what you've seen others experience. Now, these are just a few of the dynamics that shape our political viewpoints. And the best evidence of this is if you think about your parents' political view viewpoints. Right? If, you were to ask, if someone were to ask you why your dad was a Republican or why your mom was a Democrat, you would say, well, it's because of the way that they were brought up. It was the way that they grew up. And and the same is true of you, and the same is true of me. It's because of what they experience. It's because of their education. It's because of what their friends experience and what they were told. This doesn't mean that we've dismissed the significance of our faith. It means that these two things come together. We have a tendency to prop up the other. Faith with politics or politics with faith. We all do this. But if especially over the next three weeks, my friends, as we head to this election, we were able to step back and view this a little bit differently, view the, the, the political scenery and the tension and all the chaos and angst and immaturity that is going on, if we could just step back and take a breath and view it just a little bit differently, not change what we believe or who we vote for, but to see it just a little bit differently. My friends, because where you stand depends on where you sit. And recognizing this allows us to open our hands and open our minds and open our hearts without changing our political viewpoint. But beware, when you start down this road, you may change some of the way that you think. You may change some of the things of what you believe, but that is not the goal. But it may be an unintended outcome. And so let me put this all together for you. The law of Christ. The law of Christ. Non-negotiable. It informs Every decision, it ought to inform every decision that we make as people of Jesus. And then that should inform our conscience when we live up to the law of Christ, when we don't live up to the law of Christ, when our society doesn't live up to the law of Christ. We should be concerned and irritated and convicted. And to that informed conscience, we should add the knowledge and the wisdom of all that we have learned and gathered as a human people. And then that should inform our policies and our platforms and our legislation. Now, that's not really dynamic. That's kind of just an is. You, you get this, right? It's, it's, 
if you thought about this for a few seconds, you could come up with this exact same thing. So I want to take the next few minutes and explore what we do with it and what we do about it. Now, it's not complicated. It's probably not anything new. It's nothing that you haven't wrestled with already. But sometimes you have to say what everybody already knows so that we remember. We remember <laughs> to do something about it. And so these three things, as simple as these three things are, I think will help us navigate the political tension in our society. The first thing that we need to do is to listen. Listen to people who don't experience the world the same way you do. Not just the haves and the have-nots, the Christians and the non-Christians, the young and the old, the black and the white, the gay and the straight, the married and the single, old citizens and new citizens, those who love the military, those who hate the military. You need to start to listen to people who don't think the same way that you do. Instead of just getting defensive at their very being. And once you have listened, I want to challenge you to learn something. Because we're Christians, right? And our faith is tethered to an event. And so we don't need to be afraid of new information. And we don't need to be afraid of new knowledge or new opinions. We should be the most curious people on the planet. We should pay attention to the frontiers of our ignorance. That was a quote by Sam Harris. He's a famous atheist, modern-day atheist. We need, to be, we need to be aware. We need to pay attention to the frontiers of our ignorance. And the reason that I know that Sam Harris said that is because I read a book written by an atheist. Don't just read the books of people who have the same opinions and the same mindset as you. Venture out there. Be curious. It's okay. Be a student, not just a critic. Christians are amazing at being critics. Without a single lesson or ounce of knowledge in what we're criticizing. Man, we make snap judgments all the time and we know nothing about what we're even criticizing. But would you pause for a minute and become a student of those who think differently than you? Not just a critic. Otherwise, you're going to discount every bit of information and everything that doesn't fit into your already current, flawed worldview. And we quit learning, and when we quit learning, something bad happens on the inside. And my friends, you're better than that, and I want more for you than that. So if you're a Democrat, your Republican brothers and sisters, they're not crazy. And if you're a Republican, your Democratic brothers and sisters aren't crazy. They just sit in a different place. And so they see the world in a different way. And as long as we catch ourselves saying, I don't know how anybody could believe that way. I don't know how anybody could believe that. Well, all you're doing is saying something that you don't know. And so learn it. I don't know how anybody could behave that way. Well, there's something that you don't understand. I don't know how anybody could react that way. There's something that you don't understand. And so why wouldn't we, especially in the body of Christ, take the time to understand one another? To venture towards another person, even if they are, quote-unquote, our enemies. Isn't that exactly what God did for us? Everybody's behavior makes perfect sense to them. Because where they stand and how they live is where they sit. Everybody's response makes perfect sense to them. Their viewpoints, their politics, it makes perfect sense to them. And so when we don't understand something, it's because we don't understand. In fact, if you're a Republican, Democrats are just like you. And if you're a Democrat, Republicans are just like you. They are taking a stand based on where they sit, just as you are. And so the third action point that we must do then, of course, is to love. My friends, never burn a relational bridge over a political view because the you that is sitting beside you is so much more precious to God than your potentially flawed view. A view that changed 10 years ago and a view that's probably going to change in five years from now. Don't burn a relational bridge over a political view because the person next to you is so much more important than your potentially flawed view. And while you are both sinners... Christ died for you. But you would say, Ross, that's so naive. All of it's so naive. Do you really think that all of this could possibly make a difference? 
I want you to remember that once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a handful of Jesus followers crushed between the empire and the temple. And they gave to Caesar what was Caesar's, and they gave to God what was God's. They gave God their lives, and my friends, the empire is no more. And the temple is no more. Rome's most famous emperor is nothing but a footnote in the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go, empires rise, empires fall. And Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and not even the gates of hell will come against it. Nothing is ever going to stop it. And he did. He built his church. And here we are with the privilege, my friends, of speaking into a world that is so divided and is so polarized, of showing the world a better way, informed by the law of Christ. We have this opportunity to be the conscience of our nation. We have a responsibility, especially in this season, to show our divided nation and our divided world what it means and what it looks like and that it is still possible to disagree politically, but to love unconditionally and to pray for unity. Because, my friends, at Calvary, at the cross of Jesus Christ, we lost our right to do anything less. And so listen, learn, and love. And next week, we're going to continue the conversation with part two of Capital Concern. I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to be dismissed. Father in heaven, I just drank from a fire hose. I think all of us did a little bit. I know that was a lot. And I just pray that we would walk away understanding that we, as followers of Jesus, if we are a follower of Jesus, if we've committed our lives to following after Jesus, if we've trusted in what you have accomplished for us, God, then you, Father, have determined what it means to follow you. And you said, my followers will be known by their love. It doesn't matter if I attend church. It doesn't matter if I say prayers. It doesn't matter how much I give. If my life is not lived in love, Father, then am I really following you? And not just any kind of love, Father. You have determined what that love looks like. It is a dying of yourself for the betterment of another, even if that other is on the other side of the aisle, even if that other is on the other side of a political spectrum or a theological spectrum even if I consider that other my enemy. Father, you determine this. And I pray, Father, that we might have the humility and the tenacity to believe it and not only believe it, to to apply it to our minds and to our hearts and to our hands and to our actions and to our voice as we speak. And from that law, Father, I pray that we might grow into it, that our conscience would be dinged when we are not living up to it, but when our society isn't living up to it, Father, I pray I pray, Father, that we would turn and repent and ask forgiveness when our conscience is dinged because we are not living into that law. But grow that conscience up within us, Father, we do ask. In the name of your Son, we ask that you would grow up that conscience in us, Father, and let us take all of the knowledge and the wisdom that we have received over the years and throughout the generations, Father, and apply them then to our standing, where we stand, understanding that our standing, Father, is influenced by our perspectives and therefore they are subjective but your law father and your love for us despite our political differences despite the disunity that you see within the church the love that the 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 disunity that breaks your heart father you love us and that is an objective truth And so let us not rest our hope or our foundation on anything that is going to change, Father, a subjective policy or legislation or person, Father, but let us rest it on your objective, unconditional, always and forever, no matter what, love for us. At the end of the day, Father, let us then push that same love into a society that is so polarized and so divided and let us show them a different way. May it begin with us, Father. We pray this in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.